So um, there, are, there are two aphorisms that are relevant to thinking about teaching a, a, a seminar, I think. One is, uh, I can't remember who first said this, but that the only thing a Yale student remembers from a seminar is what they themselves said in it. And then the other is a story about a Harvard professor, now deceased, a political theorist who used to walk into her graduate seminars, Judith Schlar, some of you may have read some of her books, with, and her opening remark was, you can talk for as long as you make sense, and then she would interrupt everybody in the second sentence. <laughs> so th there's a tension between the, the, the implications of those two. Um, I'll, I guess we should stick with the, the format uh, suggested by Miroslav, so I'll mainly talk for the first 15 minutes and then we'll go to questions. But if anyone really is moved to try and um, uh, to, to interrupt me, uh, feel free. The, ba the basic uh, message behind my comments today um, might be thought to be provocative, uh, and I, I think it's a something somewhat contrarian with respect to the themes of this course. Uh, my basic message is that both globalization and the importance of faith or religion uh, are greatly overhyped in the current discussion, overhyped in the popular literature and in, in much of the academic literature. And I'm going to uh, say a little bit about why I think that um, in both cases. I'll start off with globalization. Um, now one sense in which globalization has been overhyped was, was uh, brought out by Doug's commentary on um, Tom Friedman's world being flat. Sometimes I think arguing about whether or not the world is flat is a little bit like arguing over whether or not the number seven is orange. Uh, but perhaps it's more the case uh, um, that, that uh, it's flatter in some respects and it's more hilly in other respects. And so the question is, you know, are the, which are the relevant respects and what do they really tell us? Uh, about the ongoing distribution of power and welfare um, and political stability in the world. Um, and how should we think about that? And I think that um, Doug makes the very valid point that most economic activity still goes on within nation states. Uh, most goods and services are uh, produced by national workforces operating under national uh, labor, labor law regimes, um, and that, that's all true, um, despite the increasing mobility of capital and the declining uh, trade barriers and so on. Um, so I think that that, that is the case, um, but I think it's overhyped in a different sense that focuses more on the political economy of globalization, not the sheer economics of globalization. Although I think more could be said about the economics of globalization simple, uh, proper uh, in that I think we actually now are witnessing something of a retreat from economic globalization towards re-regionalization of the world economy. But I'm no economist and so I won't go there uh, in any detail now. But I think that one important lesson to draw from the events of the last year and a half in the world's political economic order is that the key responses to the global financial crisis did not come from international political institutions or international uh, economic institutions. The key responses that to, the, to the global economic crisis came from national governments. Anybody who thinks that national political systems are of, of diminishing importance in the world are missing, I think, the most important fact, political fact, of the, of the international landscape. Um, the, the, the most important decisions were taken by sovereign states, uh, to some extent in agreement with one another, because they were all running scared in the same direction, but nonetheless, uh, they were decisions taken uh, principally uh, aimed at uh, salvaging the, the national economies uh, for which these governments were responsible, um, and they continue to do so. And I think that as the, as the interests of different national populations start to diverge, as people retreat from the, the sort of 
panic that the wheels are coming off the entire system, I think you're going to see more divergence of interest. We've already seen an uptick in, in um, protectionist activity. I think you'll see more of that. Um, and the reassertion of national sovereignty as a way of combating um, what's been going on. So although, e uh, though it's certainly true that this interconnectedness of economic problems, of the problems that generated this crisis, um, and there, there, there's also a lot of um, knock-on effects of the, the policies particular governments pursue in response to it. Uh, we, should, we shouldn't discount the importance of national political systems in the world. So that means attending to the nature of national political systems, and that I think inevitably puts democracy on the table. We question whether or not democratic political systems are the best response, b best able to respond to uh, the problems of globalization. And I think that I'll just, I'll just say a few things about that. Um, democratic political systems are often criticized as being not very good at dealing with ongoing problems of political economy. Uh, Amartya Sen made, made the observation once that uh, dem democracy is a good thing because on the grounds that we never have famines in democracies. Um, but I think that the example uh, is, is actually um, sort of two-sided one because what it underscores is that democracies are pretty good at responding to crises. What they're not very good at is, is responding to chronic problems. So yes, we don't get famines in democracy, but we do get poverty in democracies. Um, we're not very good at responding to chronic problems. So while the financial crisis was perceived to be at crisis levels, uh, we got very rapid response out of the democratic systems. Um, but as it's now, as, as the sense that the wheels are coming off the world ha has gone away, um, it's proving much harder, and you see now the Obama administration can't even get its resolution trust legislation through Congress. Uh, so he's essentially leaving us with a situation where we're we've now publicly admitted that we have uh, economic institutions that are too big to fail, but we neither have the nerve to regulate them nor to break them up. Uh, so uh, we haven't really resolve the problem at all. So in that sense, democracies might not very be very good at dealing with, with chronic problems. Um, nonetheless, those who say, so we should have benevolent authoritarian systems, uh, and you know, the system du jour is China. China looks like it did pretty well in this uh, crisis, even in 2008. They're not going to have double digits growth, but they are going to have 8% growth in China this year. Um, yes, they had in unemployment problems, but they're already beginning to reverse. And so I think we're going to hear a lot of hype about China uh, in the coming uh, year, months and years as an example um, of why we should have authoritarian thinking. And this is, this is a point that comes and goes uh, in, in world politics. In the 1970s and 1980s, there was a lot of um, d discussion of democracy as a kind of um, luxury good, that there would be a democracy tax on growth that, that we, we have to pay if we're going to have democracy, and that the, the in those days it was the, all the, the um, East Asian miracles that were put on the table as, as showing the virtues of authoritarian capitalism rather than democratic capitalism. And even within democratic systems, countries like Japan were held out as capable of much better macroeconomic management. And it was widely noted in connection with this that Japan uh, had had the same political party in power for, for many decades and so didn't face the normal challenges of democratic politics. But as a sa at the same time as Japanese uh, success was being hyped, um, in fact, they were piling up one poor um, allocation decision after another uh, because authoritarian systems don't have good access, access to good information. Uh, one of the good things markets do is generate information as a byproduct of competition. And so uh, 
although everybody was completely, bes completely uh, wowed by the Japanese economy in the 1970s and, and, and first half of the 1980s, the chickens finally had came home to roost in the 1990s when uh, the, it was seen that they'd been propping up w wildly inefficient industries and were uh, incapable uh, of competing um, with the more uh, market-based competitive systems. I suspect that there's a lot similar going on with respect to China now, uh, that um, massive misallocations of investment are, are starting to go on. It's very easy in the earliest stages of industrialization to know what to do. Of course, the Chinese have to invest in education and infrastructure, but once you get beyond that, governments trying to pick winners uh, don't do very well over time. And so, uh, betting on authoritarian capitalism as the wave of the future, probably not a great idea, and people should remind themselves that some of the democracies have done just as well. India, for example, uh, a very challenged democracy in many respects, nonetheless, has weathered this uh, crisis exceedingly well. It's going to have 6% growth rates this year. Uh, Canada has fit weathered it well. So the, tempta the temptations of authoritarian globalization, uh, since we're talking the language of temptations, should be, uh, I think, resisted. Let me say a few things about faith uh, and all that, and religion. Um, there's been a debate, at least since Tocqueville wrote Democracy in America, about whether or not religion is good or bad for democracy. And if it is good, uh, what variants of it are good, and if it is bad, what variants of it are bad. Tocqueville, for example, thought Catholicism was better for democracy than Protestantism uh, for a variety of reasons. I think the main one was that once you have a democracy, you no longer have the authoritative um, allocation of values by the state, and so you need some other hierarchical order for, uh, for creating values in society. Um, but in, in subsequent uh, years, it actually became more fashionable to say that Catholicism was less hospitable to democracy than Protestantism. Uh, but then, of course, we had the democratization of much of Latin America, so people began revising that notion uh, that Catholicism was not particularly hospitable to democracy, since we had many Catholic democracies. And actually, of course, uh, when you go back into the, the com combating fascism, there were certainly many Catholics who uh, opposed fascism uh, in Italy and elsewhere, so it seemed like a mo more mixed story. Uh, we've had a something of a replay of this whole debate given, one, given the rise of Islam, as whether is Islam inherently opposed to democracy? Some would say yes, some would say no, and we have uh, Huntington wheeling out his um, clash of civilizations and so on. My own view of this is that there are variants of all religions that are compatible with democracy, and there are variants of all religions that are incompatible with democracy, because religion is not particularly important either way with respect to the survival of democracy. Rather, two other things are way more important than religion. The first is economics, and the two are connected. The first one is economics, and it is that the, by far the best predictor of whether or not democracies will survive are, is economic. Basically, the, the big finding in the literature is that as per capita incomes rise toward about $6,000 a year in 1985 dollars, democracies become less and less likely to collapse. And once per capita income goes above that level, democracy survives forever. Once democracies fall below that level, they become more and more vulnerable. Um, and the further they fall below it, the more vulnerable they become, uh, to the point where uh, they very become very likely to, to fall apart and be replaced by something other than another democracy, namely some sort of authoritarianism. So um, democracy uh, becomes stable um, if, if you have economic growth and growth at per capita incomes, and 
uh, allude, just alluding to Doug's slide about inequality. The more equal, the less inequality there is, the more that, that helps as well. Uh, as inequality diminishes, uh, it helps as well. Now, there, there's not a lot of disagreement about, that about the existence of that finding. There's a lot of disagreement about why it's true. Um, but the, 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 the finding is very robust. And things like uh, culture, beliefs, institutions, all those things tend to be a very small part of the variance next to the economic datum I just gave you. Um, the State of the Art is a book on this, if you're interested, is a book called um, Democracy and Development, or Development and Democracy, I can remember, never remember which, by Adam Chavorsky and a variety of co-authors. I can give people more references if they want. My own view about why this is true connects to the second point I want to make uh, about what's important in democracy and will link us back to the religion. And that is, as countries become richer, you have less what I would call winner-take-all politics. And winner-take-all politics is, is bad because it causes people to try to get monopoly control of the political system. So um, when Al Gore discovers that he is not going to become President of the United States in January of 2001, there are many other things Al Gore can do to become happy and successful and have lots of prestige and influence in the world. He can go on book tours, he can re lead uh, environmental movements, he can be on the lecture circuit, he can be uh, on corporate boards. There are many other ways for Al Gore to win, right? But in most poor countries, the political system is the only game in town. So if you get kicked out of the politics, you essentially uh, are out of luck, right? And so politics tends to be winner-take-all politics. Um, I think that the, the analog here with religion that is important um, is that it's not so much whether or not religion exists in the political, s in, in the political system, but rather whether or not being a member of a particular relig religion puts you in a position to engage in winner-take-all politics. So it doesn't matter whether or not there's an established church so much as whether it's necessary to be a member of the established church in order to have security uh, and prosperity in the society. So we have an established church in the UK, but it's not necessary uh, to, to be part of it in order to be successful in that society. On the other hand, if you have a fundamentalist regime, uh, it's both exclusionary and it involves winner-take-all politics. You have to be part of it. it it's, it's the equivalent of, you know, it's the only game in town. And that's what becomes the threat to the survival of a democratic political order. Um, how are we doing on time here? Okay, so that I probably put enough out there, but the, so the, the, the bottom line is that uh, I think, as I said at the, at the outset, that there's, there's rather too much hype around globalization, and I think people are trying to, have been trying to load a lot more on, um, significance uh, onto the whole matter of religion in world politics than is warranted. And I think I'll just close with the observation that um, in, in, some way, in one way it's understandable. You know, if you go back to the 1950s, everybody was jumping up and down about something called modernization theory. And mo the basic idea of modernization theory was that um, the, the Schumpeterian logic of um, uh, he called it creative destruction, the creative destruction of markets. Have you guys read Schumpeter? Yeah. Uh, would slowly just grind under traditional practices. Uh, um, all forms of non-market rationality would ultimately succumb to the creative destruction 
of capitalism. There were earlier Marxist variants of this as well, um, and, and there were many besides Schumpeter, um, Seymour Martin Lipset, and our own David Apter, all pushed this idea in the 50s and 60s that it was a kind of early version of, of Tom Friedman, in a way, that you know, there were going to be these homogenizing uh, forces. And uh, that turned out not to be right. Um, the, the, the politics of modernization are multifaceted and many-sided. I think a lot of the resurgence of identity politics is in fact a response to the forces of economic globalization from the losers. Um, because uh, if, if you're a winner, it's great, but if you're a loser, there's not much in globalization for you. Why don't I stop there and you can all tell me why I'm wrong.